Hello everyone, Brian Gottlieb here. And it's Hendel here. What's up everybody? I'm Amy. I'm Hank. And we're Goblin Reserve. I'm Matt Rogers, I'm from PCG. I'm Craig Kremples. James White here, listening to the Instant Speed Podcast. This is the Instant Speed Podcast. You're listening to the Instant Speed Podcast. Welcome to the Instant Speed Podcast. <laughs> to welcome you to the Living Legend Podcast. Nope, wrong podcast. What's the name of your podcast, Flake? Not Arsenal Pass. You're listening to the Instant Speed Podcast. Easily the second best podcast for the Flesh and Blood game. Big shout out, hopefully Flake's found somebody other than me to be on it this time. Hit that like and subscribe button now. industry leader in both service and unique events in the TCG arena. Whether it's running the largest community run tournaments for flesh and blood or providing service with a generosity that is unique to the Realm Games, you can count on the Realm for an unforgettable experience. Check out their website at realmgamingnetwork.com for details about their $50,000 flesh and blood tournament circuit happening all across North America. But check out everything else going on at the Realm, including tournaments for all kinds of other experiences. And just for you, ISP listeners, use the code INSTANT5, that's I-N-S-T-A-N-T-5, to get 5% off your checkout when you're buying from the Realm. Hey friends, it's Flake, this is the Instant Speed Podcast, and I want to just go ahead and shout out, obviously, the Realm Games for sponsoring a wicked cool giveaway that we're doing, and I asked you on Twitter, I said, hey... What is your craziest sort of prediction of what is going to happen with Mistvale, with part of the Mistvale? And I said, retweet it, give me your ideas, and I've got $50 of store credit for the Realm to the winner, Draken, who has this take. The Mystic Talent is really just shorthand for Runeblade, and the new pitch icon is actually Rune Chance. Interesting take. Draken, congratulations, $50 of store credit is yours at the realm games and let's get to the episode our uh guest this week none other than josh lau fresh super fresh off of a top eight finish at the pro tour in los angeles welcome ladies and gentlemen this is the instant speed podcast brought to you always by the good people at the realm gaming network go check out the realm for sure you got to check out the realm i am joined um for episode 119 with somebody whom I've wanted to talk to you on the show for a long time. Sometimes these things happen where it's not always possible, time zones, etc. It is um, super early in the morning for you, Josh. It is not yeah. only early, but you've been traveled. You said you got wedged between uh, two pro wrestlers in a middle seat in economy for 16 hours. Now I'm exaggerating. Yeah, that, that was that was that was that was rough. Uh, you know, didn't get the upgrade, so they I, I had to stick it out 16 hours LEX to Hong Kong. For those of you who uh, who watched my videos you know like like what the heck josh this doesn't look like your normal video background well that's because i'm in hong kong and actually it is a secret that i'm in hong kong because uh i only told one person other than my family that i was coming at it that was jack tang from blue pitch and i said jack i want to just show up at your practice house and say hi <laughs> i just want to show up to an armory and be like hi i or just join a pro quest and people are like what why are you here <laughs> what a journey that would be first of all uh, surviving 16 hours yeah. in like an aerial gulag like that and then just oh, yeah. completely full fight but, but then <laughs> busting through the doors like a run in like it, like it's wrestlemania and here you are to cash <laughs> in on the on your money in the bank but uh Josh again uh, second place at the Goliath Gauntlet, uh, which w is probably your best accolade. I'm going to just throw it out. That's why we, we lead with the best. Top 32 <laughs> at Worlds in San Jose. And most recently in Los Angeles, you were in the top eight in a yep. spectacular fa in spectacular fashion, in familiar fashion. But I just want to say mm -hmm. first and foremost, obviously, welcome to uh, the Instant Speed Podcast. It's good to have you, buddy. Yep. Well, thank, thank you for having me on. It's going to be uh, – th this is the – 
first time I'm talking about any of this, so that everything is fresh in my mind as well. So, well, let's 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 dig into it and let's get into it. And who better to ask you about it than the dude who got kicked out of it? <laughs> All, uh, uh, essentially. Yeah, I heard about that. That's so rough. Dude, uh, dude. It's it's. I don't know how else to explain it. Like I I basically. <laughs> It's a long story, but at the end of the day, it came down to the, a situation where essentially the U.S. Customs official had the option to let me in, uh, mm -hmm. did not, based off of the fact that they did not understand esports and broadcasting within this industry as like a legitimate ah. thing. So they're like, well, we don't know what this is. We don't think it's legit. And then they basically said, not only are we not letting you in, we are not allowing you to attend the event upon risk of of barring you from the country altogether. I was like, oh, that's oh. just lovely. Because I said, I was like, can I just go oh. and enjoy it? And they said, you can go and enjoy anything else except for that. I said, well, thank you for that. Anyway. Oh, my goodness. That, there, it's a long story, and I don't even know if I want to uh, elaborate too much because <laughs> the wounds are still fresh. But I did I, get I to enjoy a lot of it, and part of that enjoyment was seeing you succeed to this degree because you have a lot of fans out there and i don't even want to be the ultimate fanboy here because i think the number one fanboy was calling that match it was mitch leslie <laughs> aka uber who is somebody that i know that you have a pretty decent relationship with because you're kind of like his warrior sensei is that an accurate mm. kind of statement yeah we 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 started talking when we uh when we got spoilers for the the uh i can't remember what it was I think it was Warband of Bolana around that time. Uh, so we were like, he's like, do you want to record a short video for to, to like show people or explain your thoughts on this new card? And I was like, sure. And, you know, we've always, he's always been a big fan of Dorinthia. I've, you know, loved chit chatting with him um, about that. And so every single time, the last couple sets, we've gotten spoiler cards. We're just like, all right, let's just, we'll, we'll trade the spoiler cards so we get a little juicy insight and then we'll we'll record a small video if we can uh to for the for the spoiler season and yeah i've i've that's the first time i got to meet him uh great great guy love uh love chatting with him i gave him one of my uh signature dorinthia sleeves you know i'll i'll have to give you one as well when we when we meet you know oh, this is the yes. 2024 edition so shout out to my friend pcat who, uh, Those are she's nice. An artist. Beautiful. She drew this for me for 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 Christmas. I made them into some dragon sleeves, uh, dragon shield sleeves, and uh, these are these are the ones that I use in the tournament. But I had a whole box to give out to people's, you know, one by one. I would love give one. it to him, and he was happy. So yeah. the reality is that I, I'm not quiet about this in any way, shape, or form. Is that I think in my entire career I maybe have two full games of Warrior under my belt. Uh, That's okay. Yeah, and. I, but the problem is, is also the fact that Warrior is a hero that intrigues me to a, like the nth degree because of the play style is so different yeah. than others. Uh, you know, a hero that relies on his weapon kind of sounds like Oldham to a degree back in the day, you know, yeah. and I'm yeah. very much that kind of player. So uh, I would love, love, love for an autographed sleeve wherein... Ah. Yes, I, I could get out the gold Sharpie Thank and we'll, you. we'll make it happen. <laughs> All right, so um, in terms of just quick news flashes, there was a banned and restricted announcement. We don't have to go yeah. too deep into the weeds about this, but Berserk mm. was banned, Crown of Seeds was banned, and uh, as always, mm. Brian Gottlieb wrote up a very in-depth and uh, less than concise ex sort of examination as to the, the philosophy behind it. Um, just your initial reactions, I suppose, to Berserk being banned. First of all, huge shout out to Brian Gottlieb. He, I got to meet him over the weekend. Uh, he's a just being around him and James White. I, I know the game is in very, very good hands. Shout out to, you know, both of them. Uh, the Berserk and Crown of Seeds band. I read the whole article and it's so in depth about the reasoning and you know, it, this. I, I know a lot of people will be like, "Well, it's not currently not a problem. Why do we need to, you know, ban something that's currently not a problem?" It's all about the, the the design space of the game. Uh, he mentions that 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 this is something that you know they don't want to have to design around all the time. And you know, Crown of Seeds currently there's no legal heroes in classic constructed to use them. Uh, so you know, this is a good time to do it. I think uh, both of these bands I think are both uh, both fine. And the reasoning very very in depth. I, I think Brian says something like. I want the players 
I, I want to imagine myself as a player, and then I write the BNR as if what I would want to know as a player. And it shines through when you read it. It's also, I mean, that's you're, you're spot on there. And, and again, like, I, this isn't uh, a Brian Gottlieb fan, a fan page because... Uh, I have another one. I'm that a I'm fan. A, oh, I'm, I'm a, a fan, fan too. I tell him all the time. It's funny. His his and I relationship is such that we are very very good friends, and uh, but we we are very. It's funny because when I want to say something nice to Brian, I tell his wife. I was like, "Hey, tell Brian." that xyz <laughs> and she'll like i'll tell him and then and then like she'll tell me nice things that he said about me and but when uh, we're together okay. it's like you're a doofus you're a goon you're this <laughs> yeah but he is you're you're exactly right and the fact that he's had so much experience um not just writing this kind of stuff but just also in the pro player seat and from the designer yep. aspect yeah, so he does a good job, and I think that it's spot on when it comes to sort of clipping the things, clipping the wings off things that you know are going to be limitations down the line. I've I've been listening. I, I used to play Magic: The Gathering. I listened to the Arena Decklist podcast, so I, I've I've heard his voice for you know hundreds of episodes on that. So uh, yeah, we all yeah. love that Jerry T carried that podcast yeah. for sure. <laughs> No, don't tell him that. Oh no! Yeah. I'll, I'll, damn right! Oh, no, I'll tell his wife, and his wife will tell. Oh, you, yes. you'll, tell you tell his wife. It'll, it'll, get, it'll get there eventually. Um, so let's get into you and Warrior specifically. Um, sure. I mean, if you are new to the game, this might be news to you. If you have had your, unless you've had your head in the sand for you know God knows long, how long, everybody has essentially associated Warrior and Dorinthia specifically with Josh Lau. This is a hero that you have put immense amount of study, work, reps, and and personality into, and now you have been rewarded with not only people seeing that the hero has had the success that it has, but also the fact that you you have been this trusted voice and this trusted. Um, you know, master when it comes to this particular hero, I want to ask you where this all originated. And again, this is a conversation that I haven't had with you and I'm sure that you've talked about it a lot. So for those who don't know me included, where did that pairing that, that partnership originate? Okay. So when I first started the game, I played, I, I opened a mask of momentum in my very first box. I, I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to play Ninja and, at that time in Hong Kong, every event was blitz because uh, culturally in Hong Kong, we don't get off work till late. So a lot of the armories start at 8 p.m. So if we're playing classic constructed, we're not getting home by when the trains close. <laughs> so in Hong Kong, we're like, we're, we're arriving at the LGS at eight, we're playing four blitz rounds, we're getting out by 10, we're getting home at 11. That's, that's how it was. So uh, Katsu wasn't viable then, so I played Ira uh, for a couple weeks, and there was a player in Hong Kong, huge shout out to Mortal. He was so consistent, and he kept winning and winning and winning and winning and winning. And I was like, first of all, I never saw that consistency in Magic the Gathering at FNMs. Who won FNM? It was a roulette. You know, it rotated. But it, at these armories in Hong Kong, Mortal was just crushing it again and again and again. And that's the first thing that the, the first thing that kind of drew me to the game was like, okay, there's you could be really, really, really consistent, right? That was the first thing that drew me. And he was playing Ira. And then he switched, you know, he was like, okay, I, I've played some Ira. He played Dorinthia. So I played Ira against Dorinthia, and I got destroyed. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay. Looks like Dorinthia is basically a giant knowledge check. I got I to gotta know the card pool. I got to know the possible lines. And so the best way to do that I'll play some Dorinthia. I'll figure out how how to play it, and then I'll go back to Ira, and then I will never lose to Dorinthia again because it's just a knowledge check, right? And so I did that, and I played Dorinthia, and I was like, well, I really, really like this play style. I really, really like how there's so many decisions. And I never went back to Ira. <laughs> I never played Ira again. <laughs> So uh, that's basically the origin story of Dorinthia. I really, really enjoy the play style. It's very interactive. You can speed up, you can slow down, but there's tons of decision making as well. So I just adore the class. It puts their opponents in tough spots. I've said this many times. The, the common thread among warriors is not that they have a ton of armor. It's not that they love their weapons. The common thread between all the warriors is they put their opponents in 
damned if you do, damned if you don't situations again and again and again. And that's what I love about where they basically say, hey, we're going to interact whether you like to interact or not. <laughs> and that's what I love about Warrior. And, yep, every the single one of them is history, I, love them. I guess. I, and it, yep. it, it's great because it sounds like you just had this sort of once you go Dory, you'll never be sorry kind of moment. Like, that's just yep. where, you're, where you've landed on. And it's beautiful because there was the same kind of um, – when I've – Try, when I tr people who try new games or just try mm -hmm. any game at all or tr you know once you return to something even for example like I quit Hearthstone for many years and when I jumped back in I was like let's just see there was a I was not into it until like one deck speaks to you or something sings mm. to you and says this is the style when it comes to yep. flesh and blood it was the same thing it was like I started on Katsu then I played other decks and eventually I landed on Guardian I was like yes 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 it, this is what it is and I'm glad that it found you found that moment, um, and and it kind of benefited yeah. everybody because, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm one one thing though. I I have to huge shout out to LSS. Like the game design is just is just great. I, I'm very blessed to have found a class that I like, and not just a hero. I know there are some people that like. Oh, I just like this hero from this class because it's so radically different. But it's that common thread that I'm like, you you give me any warrior in the next 15 sets, I will probably really love them to death. Like, for example, I love Olympia to death. He's not that powerful, but I love him to death. And actually, Olympia was partly why I ended up on Hatchet's Dory, is because I was playing Hatchet's Olympia for a while. So it all kind of, you know, t ties through. Well, we'll talk about that in just a brief moment here, but I do also yeah. want to ask you about one of the things that mm -hmm. I think is one of the coolest damn aspects of 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 personality and professionals which is this world famous route that you have <laughs> um uh, look yeah. i am such a fan of the lore of not the game itself and the characters but the players who mm -hmm. play it the backstory and the relationships and kind of the fun little gimmicks and you know you have uh, people like Mara Farris, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, who mm -hmm. has essentially developed this persona. She, th there's Mara Farris, the person, and then there's Mara Farris, the fab player, and she's got this aura to her. And then there's Josh Lau and this route, this famous <laughs> route that when I heard about it, I was like, this is exactly what I want more of. Can you explain <laughs> this infamous route? Right. Okay. So route, you know, hate it or love it. I, personally, I love it. It's one of the most iconic cards in the game because it has a extremely unique effect in that it returns a card that is defending to hand. And oftentimes, this is the killing blow. This is the thing that is either played from hand or singing Steel Blade into route. And it often is the game ender. It is the knife in the heart <laughs> or the Dawn Blade in the heart. And so every single time I get somebody with route for game, I take out my Sharpie and I add a tick to the uh, back of the card, kind of like Counter-Strike uh, stat track weapons. <laughs> and, you know, it's... put it back in the sleeve. Oh, and God. Say, Another one for the route. Look, Wedge Antilles has uh, on his X-Wing two Death Stars and countless TIE Fighters, okay? Um, that's kind of what I equate you to is this hot shot, like, Top Gun yeah. pilot just – wreck and face uh, you know like a double a triple a quadruple ace how many mm -hmm. notches are on that are on that route right now there's 67 <laughs> and that was from 2023 the 2024 one is still occurring stuff though <laughs> well we'll count it at the end of the year oh i so switched you, it out you have a it's new yearly. one for every year you it's, it's every year dude yeah. this is in this is <laughs> insane where are the previous routes they're 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 in, uh, they're in Alabama right now, they, but the, the current one is somewhere in my luggage because my deck didn't actually have route, unfortunately. I really wanted to put it in. I was like, do I put a route in my deck just to so yeah. I could get some extra stat checks? And eventually I was like, ah, I just can't find the room. Ah, I guess we'll we'll just uh, we'll just put the route in the box for now, not the deck box. Well, I'll ask you this yeah. then because this has sort of been brought up a few times here. Um, would you have preferred route? Or that time snap potion. <laughs> that might be a oh, little man. bit of a that, that time snap potion was a heart of Fendel until like five PM the day before. 
And so the uh, the story behind that was originally I had Hard Offendle in the main board, Time Snap in the sideboard, and I did not have Unmovable in my sideboard. And I was like, you know, against Azalea, Bravo, if you have a Soul Read on the Dory, like against the Assassins, like it's just not one card can make a big, big difference. So I was like, okay, I'm going to add a movable to my sideboard. I got to make room somewhere else. I looked at the list up and down. I couldn't find a good solution for that. I was like, okay, the solution is cut hard of put the time snap potion into the main board. And that gives us one extra slot and doesn't change our blue ratio or anything. So that's, that's eventually what I did putting that uh, time snap potion. That's the hard of if the Heart Offender was in the list, uh, the game probably would have looked a little different. I probably would have gained two life over the course of the game. Might have been a little bit different, but uh, you know, I, I don't hate Time Snap Potion. I, I love I love Epot and Time Snap. Time Snap has gotten me through very rough times. Time Snap was uh, back when Prism could uh, ALS your Bolton combo. I had to play Time Snap, and I I've been playing for quite a while. So I played in the Crucible of War. That's what when I started was roughly Crucible War. Um, Time Snap Potion and Energy Potion were really, really fundamental to Dorinthia because we didn't have all the go-agains and agility tokens that we do now. And back then, one of the most threatening things you could do was Spoils of War Swing because it threatens a Twinning Blade with the Unconditional go again. So back then, we would go Time Snap Potion, Activate, Swing, and it's super threatening, the Dawn Blade, because if I have Singing Steel Blade, it doesn't matter how you block. I could go over, I could go around. And that, so I, I, I love Time Step. It got me killed, but I love Time Step. I, I, I'm not going to yeet my <laughs> Time Step potion across the convention hall like people thought I was. <laughs> well, that was, yeah. So that was basically a question asked by the Armed Pit says, do I have permission to hate yeah. Time Snap potion? And also, um, coming. Nah, it's a good card. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Also, the number one yeah. Cramorant fan uh, asks, say, yeah. yeah, if you can go back, would you have, you, you know, yeeted it up and then like watching this it was from what i understand you you did not sideboard a single card you just went with the whole kit right yeah so i tested with nathan crawford and and the team literally we were testing five games i couldn't win a single game unfortunately and we were like there's only one out to winning josh you present your whole deck and he presents like 60 to 63 cards, you play perfect defense, and you'll run him out of cards by about three. And so what happened in the game was I presented 70, he presented 65. I know what he didn't, he sideboarded out Amnesia, three copies of Amnesia, he cited out his Down and Dirty, he cited out his two Oasis. So he could have presented 71, he presented 65. So 65 against 70, and as soon as he said, I presented 65, I'm like, that is the closest of margins that basically will come down to one card if we're both playing perfectly. And so that one card, because I don't have tunic, the one card to fuel my ultra, 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 ultra late game would be time step potion. Whereas his ultra, ultra, ultra late game would be his tunic. It, it would literally, I think if we, I didn't die on that turn and we proceed all the way to the end game, I have one card left in deck and he has zero. But this... The time snap would kill him fast three times faster than the tunic would kill me. That is such a fascinating element. And again, when it comes down to high level flesh and blood and the elites playing, it's Pro Tour. You obviously, if you make a top eight of Pro Tour, you are without a doubt one of the best players in the world, obviously. What I'm getting at with that is the fact that you already have the foresight to know that based off of just the fact that you anticipate, obviously, your opponent being the skill level that they are and you being who you are. With the with the deck numbers, you're like, if we both play perfectly, it's gonna come down to that. And that that to me fascinates me. And this is also part of why when we're discuss like when the discussion occurs of like you mentioned earlier, the fact that there's consistency in success with, with the work that's put in, like this is just what separates you and the top eight from you know, Joe or Judy Schmo who wants to go to a tournament and say, hey, maybe I'll get lucky. And like, I'll be completely honest with you. I have, uh, you know, like I'll, I'll play other games and be like, holy, sh holy shit, I went on a run. Like, in, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you still need some skills, but the fact that you knew down to the penny, like the, what it would cost to get you there is fascinating <laughs> to me. It is just unreal, man. I, I think in the game of flesh and blood, there's just enough variance that, you know, you, you can get there, but 
if you think about the amount of decisions that you're making on defense and offense, you are making thousand, uh, seriously, a thousand decisions in a game is not uncommon because of the the order that you do things and because you play on both sides, offense and defense. If if you're not an elite player and you play against an elite player and you make some a couple mistakes, let's say you make one percent of decisions wrong, over a thousand. That means you've made 10 mistakes during a game. And, you know, it, it actually comes down to whether or not you can punish those mistakes as well. So it's, uh, it's the, the game is has some variance, but actually has very low variance. Like what I said with Mortal, I was like, how can somebody just be this consistent winning all these armories? So same thing here. You you see the the same players in the in the top 32 fairly consistently consistently they might not get the top eight because getting top eight is 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 very very difficult but getting top 32 if you're able to consistently do that you are you know an elite player well you certainly showed it and again the entire field was was riveting um and I want to talk to you uh, yeah, about that, that was a tough field. <laughs> it was unreal, back, yeah. super strong. And congratulations to to the winner from France. And um, well, you know, I, I do want to say, however, that, that finals. <laughs> that's I say this to everybody, and like, like obviously, you're in a bad spot, and you play to your outs. Like you always play to your outs. If you have a one percent yeah. chance, well, you never know, man. Like you roll the d one hundred, and maybe it comes up. You know with the with the nat critty but ultimately that is uh the the one like people might look at that and be like wow what a what a robbery or whatever well maybe it is maybe it isn't the card's in there for a reason and it and if that's your out you play for that's that your out. Out. that's your yeah, out um, exactly so let's talk about well, pro tour well, here yep. um i want to ask let's, you first let's of all jump into it yeah, well, like it's it's fresh in everybody's mind. Like you said, you just got home. So mm -hmm. I, again, thank you so much for for just being yep. on the show. Uh, but beyond that, the meta was something that was a, in significant point of discussion moving into it. Everybody had their read on it. The amount of tier lists were hilarious because everybody had their different options and here and there. But at the end of the day, Josh, we did a chart. <laughs> well, <laughs> pie charts. This, a tier list. <laughs> but yeah, but but at the same time, this this is um, fascinating to me because there were a lot of similarities, but there was a lot of points yep. of of uh, discrepancy between Team mm -hmm. A, Team B, Group A, Content Creator B, whatever. But at the end of the day, what was the biggest surprise for you when you were going into that final day? You had made top eight, and you're sort of reflecting on it. What was what kind of popped in your head? So like. I didn't expect this many blank or wow, there was, you know, less blank I, than I thought. Okay. There, there's two that stand out in my mind and that might've just been because of the route that I took to get to the top eight. I did not play against a single victor. I did not play against a single Katsu. So they both underperformed, although Victor, I don't think underperformed. I think Victor did well, just the, the pilots maybe didn't, do well in draft and they ended up in the top 32 but they didn't, didn't quite make it to the top eight but there was less victor less katsu that's really what stood out to me um significantly less levia uh pilots as well um and there was significantly more dorinthia that i thought i was completely caught off guard that the whole uh runaways team was going to bring all 10 of them or 10 of the 11 were or 10 of 12 were going to bring hatchet story so when i when i first saw it, i was like okay number one ko all right it's 70 something copies makes sense number two drove my yeah 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 70 something copies number three huh <laughs> what <laughs> what is going on here 29 dorinthias and then later i find out that at least 12 of those were hatchet dorinthias probably more because there were 10 there was max and i that's 12 so 12 of 29 hatchet dory and I was like, eh? what's going on? <laughs> I, I was, in my head, I was like, okay, sure. You you want to play a Don Blade, Don Blade Dory to me? Go ahead. Try try your best. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that, that's. But basically, my my route through the uh, through the uh, tournament, I played against a a Phi and then a Dromai. Oh, Dorinthia, and then Prism. That was day one. Day two, Prism, Leviah, KO, KO. 
So I did not play against a Guardian. I did not play against... Uh, I played against Un-Ninja. I played against... Uh, Fi. A Fi, but I didn't play against a Katsu, so... Um, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what stood out to me, that I, we didn't really see any... I From from my team's testing, uh, we, we, we thought that Katsu was in a very, very good spot, but... Uh, it looks like uh, not quite the time yet for, for Katsu. Yeah, maybe. I suspect that it, it's going to get some help moving forward. However, I will. I, I do want to say this. I wanna, I'm want i going to take a spot here, a little executive mm -hmm. decision, a little uh, VIP okay. privilege. Let's hear it. <laughs> when I wrote the article for LSS of, like, what to expect at whatever, I, I wrote this, like, gigantic 5,000-word long tome of stuff and then they ended yeah. up they're like look we're gonna have to cut this down can you cut down some of the stuff i said sure mm -hmm. in it i said that despite kasai getting all the fanfare and all the noise dorinthia mm -hmm. is going to be the warrior to come out of this that Ooh. is dorinthia's however you called it it got ah. cut. It got cut for time. It got edited ah. out, so it never made the article. I have the original copy of the article in PDF yeah. timestamp. Not that there it matters, go. but I'm just like I. I. I was like I. You, you called know, it. I did. I called my shot on that one. Yeah. I also said that like seven other heroes are gonna do well. So I mean, what uh, what yeah. kind of credence does that give me? <laughs> um, so moving forward, though, you know, there's always this discussion based off of the fact that the meta was so volatile and there's a lot of teams even team pcg pass i spoke to them a day before they left or a couple days before they left and they're like we have no freaking idea a lot of teams were like that so to a degree when everything's so up in the air a lot of the conversation leans towards well just go with what is still okay still strong but comfortable that you don't necessarily need to play out of your comfort zone there's not much more that you need to learn in terms of matchups was you you know, you landing on Dory, is that a matter of comfort over meta? Were you always going to be on Dory? Is that just what you do? Or how do you view that discussion of comfort versus versus meta? Oh, man, I have quite the story to tell you. Okay, so basically, I've, I've been streaming every single week on Tuesdays, if you have the Card Guys YouTube channel. And my final stream, I was like, guys, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I don't know what I'm playing at Pro Tour. And it's like a week away. I don't know what I'm doing. And eventually, what I decided to do, I got out a coin and I flipped it. And I said, heads, Dorinthia, tails, Bolton. If it lands straight, I'll play Olympia. <laughs> fun fact. Fun fact, scientists have wasted their time and determined that the chance that a coin lands on its side is 1 in 6,000. So there was a 1 in 6,000 chance. There is an alternate reality where Josh Lau was playing Olympia at Pro Tour, okay? So that, that does exist. So I flipped the coin. It landed on Dory. I'm like, great. I still need to flip another coin because I don't know if I'm playing Dawn Blade or Hatchets. And I flipped another coin. And it landed on Hatchets. I'm like, all right, that's what we're doing. It, it's that, it's incredible that, that that's what happened well look what it that's led to you i know because that one that that one in six thousand josh lau is mm -hmm. pr was probably spending saturday um doing like a draft somewhere or or whatnot yeah you know? probably yeah alternate uh, reality josh uh, uh, i'm glad i'm in this reality so well thank that coin where's that coin yeah. right now <laughs> uh it's it's, it's in my pocket somewhere, yeah. probably in my jeep. <laughs> Put it next to the routes on, yeah. on top of like that should that yeah. that it was, coin. It was just a corner. It's just like what a, I didn't have a special coin. I should have flipped. I I, I should have flipped my uh, arsenal protector coin. I I should have did that. This, well, the, this is a the arsenal protector coin. Yeah, I should that, have flipped this. I just flipped a regular quarter. This would have been a better story though. <laughs> well, that is that in itself was a little bit of a point of, of discussion as mm -hmm. well, is because you put that coin over top of your arsenal and yeah. can you yeah what is first of all what is that coin i see that the tar, the card guys mm -hmm. logo on it but what is the significance of that and why do you put that coin on top of the arsenal okay so we we made uh these coins back in 2022 uh when we were uh just getting started as uh as well not as a team but as like a flesh and blood team um and we have one for each of our members they're different colors, and these are basically our challenge coins. So if you challenge one of us, or you play one of us in an event, you can challenge us for, for one of these. 
I've already lost I've already lost 24 challenges. So this is my last one. This is my personal coin. I keep this one. Uh, and uh, basically, if if you win, I'll give you the coin. Right? Uh, we we have to print 2024 version because I've run out of coins. Uh, but yeah, it has it, everybody's has a different thing on the back. I got the Dom blade on the back, right? And it has our logo. It says thanks for the game. Uh, and then it says Fab TCG 2022, right? And so eventually, I was like, you know what? This is this is a nice accessory. We might as well be able to do something with it. Normally, it would have like one pitch, two pitch, but it's not very clear, right? So uh, eventually, I started. Uh, putting this over my arsenal because I was, I often like to, I, I'm not a card flicker. I hate flicking cards. First of all, it creates a lot of annoying noise. It also creates the possibility that you drop the card, that you flash the card. And I don't actually think you can concentrate when your the card faces are changing in front of you. So I almost never flick my cards like that, right? I often set my hand down. Warrior sometimes makes their opponents tank for a long time because of the nature of the class, right? So oftentimes I'm putting my hand down and I basically, I put this over my arsenal to show good faith to my opponent that, hey, I'm not doing anything funny. I'm not switching my arsenal out. I'm not, you know, you don't have to worry about that. I put this on top of my arsenal to keep it safe. It doesn't protect it from command and conquer, but it, it protects me from accidentally, you know, messing up my hand with the arsenal, basically. And uh, I encourage more people to to just put something on their arsenal that that's just maybe as a courtesy to other players. That's not <laughs> that's also, bad. I think. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think it's it's fair, especially for like I am like you, like especially. When I have, it's all it's always the same. Like I'll present an attack, and I have like a card in hand, and this and that, and a card in arsenal, and they know yeah. it's going to be a pummel, and they're thinking about things. I just put the card yeah. down, and I'm like you. I, I don't fiddle with stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I would typically, I put my resource coin if there's nothing left. I would put it on the arsenal, or I put it on the top of the deck. But mm -hmm. the number one egregious violator of card flicking, T Tebow. I see you, T. <laughs> I see you, T. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're if right. If you've played against, he loves it. He is just, he is at kneading the dough. Oh, my God. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love the guy. Yeah. But uh, either way. So, yeah, I was just curious. So that one, one, one more quick point on that. Also, it eliminates the question of when you have one card left, either in hand or in arsenal, it prevents the question of, is that card in your hand or in your arsenal? Because that's relevant information, right? Uh, so just having a, co a small object on your arsenal, we don't have to ask that question. We could save five seconds of our time. Well, you know what's next, right? Is the next uh, step to that is people are going to start bringing like paperweights, and then some people are going to bring entire like <laughs> gigantic mcfarlane-esque statues to just dry, like the figurines well, then, and stuff you're probably gonna mark your cards then don't do that <laughs> Keep some, something lightweight and just you know just just enough to to tell <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about the fact that like you mentioned it's hatchets over dawn blade and y you let mm. the fates decide but how about um the just the philosophy behind it the 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 thought process the strategy behind it and mm -hmm. pat uh pat smash good asking basically what brought hatchets to the to the uh tournament over something like Dawnblade. what is the thought process mm -hmm. behind that so the shout out to olympia I, I i hopefully i haven't used all all my shout outs yet but shout out to olympia uh because that's where it all started i was playing hatchet olympia on stream and i was uh, the numbers were good. The deck was operating fine. I mean, people were people were always like, ah, Olympia, you know, C tier, D tier. Okay, it's not quite Arachne, but it's a, how much better is it than Arachne? And I took I took Hatchet's Olympia to an RTN and got top eight, and you know, conceded so somebody else could get a Nats invite. I was like, I I could have won that RTN with Olympia if I went all the way there. Uh, and then I, I saw Andre C's uh, Nino in the Philippines. I watched his game. I'm like, I mean, the, the numbers are really good. Hatchets Olympia presenting consistent 
great damage, good output, utilizes the vigor and agility tokens excellently, blocks very well, able to slow down, able to speed up. This deck is not bad. You you print like two more cards for Olympia, and he's there. And and so I, I was like, okay, okay. So so that's that's oh, obviously I can't really bring Olympia to the Pro Tour. He's not a complete hero quite yet. They're, they're, they've been sandbagging some of the cards. Okay, we look at Dorinthia. Dorinthia classically has always had a hatchet build ever since uh, Everfest. That was a viable build for her. But the metagame was never quite right for that. So played some games with Hatchet Dorinthia. I saw how well Hatchet Dorinthia did at the Battle Harden in Kiel. And eventually I was like, and then I, I talked with a, a, a buddy, his name is uh, Joe. And eventually I was like, you know what? There's, there's just, everything's coming together. Okay, I, I think I can build something that works here. And, you know, I, I looked at some of the some of the lists, kind of combined what I liked and you know <laughs> the rest is history there well it worked out uh, it took you all the way there and you got bumped out by maximilian klein from germany mm -hmm. on basically a similar build there was the tunic versus um uh, non-tunic mm -hmm. build which is what you were running mm -hmm. and uh walk us a little bit about the process of you said you know you had a plan into it you were to a degree, based on your testing, you were somewhat of an underdog in that you've, but you played to your outs. It just didn't work out. But how about uh, talk to us a little bit about your confidence going into a mirror match like that, and just the fact that hey, this is the, probably one of the highest stakes games I'll I'll ever be involved in up to now, or I've been involved in up to now. Um. Well, the the way the feature match area is designed, you could really get in the zone and concentrate, even though. The stakes of the game were really, really high. Max is a very friendly guy. I was getting to play a game of Flesh and Blood. There are a lot of non-games, but a Dorinthia Mirror is always going to be a game. And that's, you know, at the end of the match, I was smiling. I was happy. I was like, I got to play a great Flesh and Blood game against one of the best players in the world. And, you know, even though I lost, I'm still happy that I got to play great Flesh and Blood. I would be upset if I played a non-game. Win or lose. I, I don't like to have non-games. <laughs> so I'm glad that I got to have a, a game with Max. He's a great guy. Very, I gave him one of the Dorinthia sleeves, and he took out his dory and put it into the sleeve. Ah. And I was like, we, we, we have that bro connection, you know? <laughs> and... He, we, we had a couple, even though we were, it was a very, very serious game, we still had some banter during the game. So it's, it was great. Um, that game came down to several very, very key moments. And the very first key moment was the Command and Conquer hitting on turn two. <laughs> I saw him block with the Command and Conquer early. I was like, okay, in this matchup, you generally want to set up a little bit. So I was like, and eh, there's probably not a third attack coming if I block this. Unfortunately, I got caught by the CNC. That was actually worth like seven value. Unfortunately, so I started behind and that that was something I was like, okay, I got to really mentally concentrate here because that was very, very, very devastating. And it happened on turn two. And I'm like, this game is going to go 20 turns. I can't let I can't get I can't let that get in my head. I got to, you know, remain disciplined, remain, remain calm. I'm behind, but we, we could grind it out over 20 turns. So we proceed into the grind. And in the middle of the game, I pitch a time snap potion and during the turn cycle, he has some sync blows and fate for scenes, and I'm unable to quite check, keep track of his pitch stack because there's some unknown cards there. And I'm like, that that's a really bad sign that 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 sync and fate is happening right now when I pitch my single no block in my deck. But I'm like, okay, maybe maybe I'm like, I, in my head, I'm like, uh oh, he, he this this is probably gonna bite me in the ass in about. 12 turns but we'll see <laughs> so we proceed down the game and we and then it's coming down just like i thought i was like okay i presented 70 he presented 65 currently i'm ahead by like three or four cards if it plays out how you know nathan and i talked about the day before it's going to come down to one or two cards and so strategically because that is the end game state it is on max to make a move he has to create a burst turn 
and end the game before we get to that fatigue state because I'll have one or two extra cards. And when I drew to my time snap potion, he had the red blade runner, red hit and run, and the in the swing. And I, you know, I died there exactly. I was like, you drew it up that way. Congratulations. That was very, very beautiful. And if some people might say, oh, 20 turn Dory Hachimura is really boring. There were so many decisions between him and I that whole game. I could tell he was adapting his play style. I was adapting my play style during the game. And there were so many decisions. And he played perfectly. I thought, watching it back, I thought I didn't make any mistakes either. And it, there was just so many decision making. It's, it was just a really, really beautiful game. I, I One of the most beautiful games of Flesh and Blood, even though it's, it, it wasn't really flashy. But if you, like, I, I watched it back. Brian said, you know, as a flesh and blood nerd, this this is the type of game. The the jockeying back and forth, the the pitch stacking up to a perfect moment, pushing the point on that one turn where you knew you had your opportunity. Uh, yeah. So, well, um, yeah. That was the it was a great game. A lot of the fanfare and a lot of the the positivity that came out of the Pro Tour was the fact that every single game seemed to appeal to various different levels of player yeah. and spectator, where the the casual watching is watching some a lot of damage being sent back and forth, which is exciting. But also the purists, the the the, the quote unquote students of the game, without sounding too elitist <laughs> about this nonsense. But like you mentioned, it's just uh -huh. the fact that a twenty turn game for me is not a slog. If if it's a game of just you know, I've 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 seen oldem sledge mirrors where it's block two cards, send hammer, block two cards, send hammer, and then. And then it's the tunic turn. You can block three cards, and that's kind of how it goes. And the the reason that it gets so weird is there's attack reactions. You have to know what is possible and determine, like, okay, if then, if then, if then, if then, if then, and then come to your conclusion. Whereas I think in the sledge mirror, it's a little bit more straightforward. It's like, for sure, that's wow, a slog. No surprise here. Yeah, no, that is an actual <laughs> slog. Like, I'm not going to be where people are, are are basically like, life doesn't matter. It's all about card equity and where you're at. The I'm, Oh, I'm down two cards. I got to catch them up somehow. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you, you had an in, incredible run. And mm -hmm. you can thank the coin that you flipped. You could thank your team, the prep, and everything else. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, um, you had an incredible run, but it did end, you know, in your eyes prematurely. I mean, you once mm -hmm. you get to the top eight, it's you don't stop there. You know, every day is mm -hmm. just make it to the next. And when you hit that Sunday, it's not about mm -hmm. making it to the next day. It's about making it to the next game. You had a brilliant game in that one. You had a plan. It didn't quite work out. When it comes to overcoming those types of losses, and you've played so many high leverage games in your life, but one of the difficult aspect is hey you could look at it from the perspective of holy crap i'm a top eight in pro tour i've won all this you know i've won some money i've won some more notoriety i've i've cemented further cemented my legacy on this particular hero but at the end of the day you're there's only one player in that room who is leaving on a w and mm -hmm. how do you overcome that baggage that you might have to bring home with you do you leave it at the table do you fly home with it like when do you toss that garbage out I, I i don't like to be burdened down by such thoughts in general i in general i try to maintain a very positive mindset and as long as i had a good game i f i feel very happy when when we both play at a high level and we actually have a game we don't have bolted against icelander for example <laughs> like and when we have a mid-range back and forth game, when we have lots of interaction, good banter, win or lose, I'm I'm walking out of there like feeling fulfilled, which is which is really really nice. And uh, obviously, it stings. I, I looked at the bracket. I was like, man, I my, I know my deck is good against KO, especially the way I built it. It's like the grains just activates consistently against Kano or KO. Sorry, and then. Because my deck is slightly more aggressively slanted, I think I could have done well against uh, Arthur in the finals as well if it came to that. So part of me is like, man, if I didn't get this bracket, I might have gotten further. You know, there could have been an alternate universe, you know. Uh, but 
I'm not trying to think about that too much. I'm just happy that I got to play good games at the highest level. Um, I love the guys at my armory. I love the guys at my pro quest and all that, but I really enjoy the pro tour games. The game becomes a different game at the highest level and it's really, really beautiful. And it's not always obvious why it's beautiful, but uh, you know, that game with Max, I, I'll always remember. It's a very, very beautiful game. Win or lose. That outlook is beautiful. And I don't know how else to better describe it. I try my best to sort of inject positivity because I'm not the best player, obviously. I, I, but I think I'm a good player, but I have so many losses under my belt. And the problem is, is like you said, is that if you carry that stuff home with you, it becomes yeah. a little bit cumbersome. It, it just bogs you down. And I try my best to sort of just empty my pockets when I'm done a game and like, you know, when I lose a game yep. and just say, let's just leave this here. If, if you can look back at the game very critically, very logically and say, I don't think I made any mistakes. That's the best that you can do. And sometimes the cards don't line up. Sometimes you get CNC with two D reacts in hand, <laughs> you know, it, it happens. Right. So we, we just have to, some, sometimes your opponent draws two fate for scenes when you draw your known block and they get to hide two cards. That's just how the cards lined up. That's how we shuffled them into existence. Um, we do what we can to control what we can. Everything else, if we can't control it, we got to let that go, you know? Hell yeah, Josh. Hell yeah. That's what I like to hear. I like to hear it. But again... It's it, 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 it. There's so much work that was put in to that result that you pulled off. It's well deserved, and obviously, nobody out there is thinking that this is sort of like any type of last hurrah. This is just to me. This is just no. It's Josh Lau. It's it's Warrior Dorinthy or whatever. There's gonna be a success story here, and we're all waiting because it's it's gonna happen. Be it a semifinal appearance, a final appearance, or a win on the big stage. Might be in Amsterdam, might be in Osaka. We don't know. We'll see. We will see. I do plan on going to both of those. Um, so you'll see me there. Hell yeah. That's, <laughs> that's going. I hope, well, I was going to say Amsterdam's not in the United States. So yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. There we go. Uh, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the state of Warrior in general before we dig into mm. um, the card guys as a team. But the state of Warrior mm -hmm. in general is such that this is a hero that a lot of people, like you mentioned, it's a... Playing against it is a knowledge check. You need to know what they're capable of with resources and cards in hand. Playing the hero, a different story. I, mm. I had mentioned earlier that it's a hero that I don't touch because to me it feels like one of the heroes that, like Kano, like, you know, or Wizard in general, it seems to me like the hero that requires the most amount of understanding, of study, of potential, of that decision tree. Mm. You know, you play your first card, there are the branches and tentacles that sort of spawn out of those those decision trees is is, is very daunting and intimidating so where yep. is warrior at now from a meta perspective and i suppose from the perspective of just complexity for learning this hero so the complexity of the hero comes that you're playing both sides you're playing defense and offense because every single warrior is a mid-range deck that can be sideboarded into aggressive or defensive, all four of them. Uh, even Kasai that is leaning very slow. She could speed up a little bit. She could slow down if she wants. And the, that's the complexity of the hero is when you have to play defense and offense, You the amount of decisions you make is doubled. Like if you're playing Phi, you're not really defending. You're playing half the game and you're playing a little bit of defense at the end of the game, realistically, right? So. As a warrior, you you have to defend, and then the it's a game of knowledge. What you defend with gives your opponent information, and especially if they're if they, because defense happens before offense. If they have a wide attack pattern, you have to determine. Okay, you have to predict your opponent's attack pattern. Do I need to give them extra cards during this turn? How does that affect my turn? And then once you get to your own turn, there's all the knowledge is there. It's like, okay, if I play this first, if I play this second, if I have, you know, calculating whether your opponent will block or not is actually the hardest thing. And that's why I like to play the Warriors as a mid-range. I like to spend the first five turns getting a feel of my opponent. 
kind of poking them here, poking them there. I'm like, okay, do you like to block? How do you like to block? Do you do you, are, do you understand this is a threat? Do you not understand this is a threat? So the I, I like to you know block a little bit more in the first five turns, get a feel for my opponent, and then I can adapt. And that's 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 generally how to do it as warriors. You got to adapt to the way your opponent is playing. Figure out which corners you can cut. Figure out if they're playing scared. And there, there's a whole nether layer of like the the mo the poker and the mental game of things. It's like okay, once I understand the tendencies of my opponent. I can make more optimal decisions. I can squeeze extra value from that. And that's kind of, you know, the the, how, the, the, the difficulty of Warrior is that you, there's just so many decisions, right? Um, and it's, a, it's a class that heavily rewards experience. It also heavily rewards playing in the flesh and blood. Playing on Talishar, fine, but is, is fine. But in IRL, there are so many little things you can pick up just playing like how they hold their cards, the speed at which they block, the speed at which you attack as well gives information. If Josh Lau is tanking on a seemingly simple decision, this one of the hardest players in the game for me to play against is Nathan Crawford because he understands me so well. <laughs> and I talk to him a lot. I actually can't beat the guy. Like he he just knows exactly. It's like, yeah, okay, so this, 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 this. Okay. Okay, so... Okay, no blocks. I'm like... Oh, how did you come to that conclusion? And, <laughs> like, I, he just knows me perfectly. And my point is that, like, if if they if your opponent knows exactly what you're gonna do, like, it's it, the game becomes really really hard. So you gotta you gotta adapt to the player that you're playing. You gotta be able to know what shortcuts you can take. And yeah, as for the state of uh, Warriors right now, so with Dromai basically LLing, she she's at nine nine six. LL points are, have been moved to three, so she just needs to win two pro quests. It's going to happen week one. So basically, week two pro quests and onward, we have a completely different metagame. So traditionally, every warrior has been weak against Illusionist. That's just the nature of not having poppers, plus being reliant on go again and having having a difficult time clearing the board. Um, so with them leaving, that actually helped all the Warriors. All the Warriors get substantially better with Dromai leaving. Uh, we have extra sideboard cards, sideboard slots that we can dedicate to things. Now, the thing is, with Dromai leaving, I also think Prism gets better. So maybe we don't gain extra sideboard slots. So we'll, we'll see. The thing is, Prism is a very, very difficult deck to, to play. So I think uh, maybe it won't become too meta. Um, so yeah, that in general, I think all the Warriors will, will be doing better. An interesting thing is that if Hatchet Dorinthy becomes more meta, I think that actually creates a situation where Dawnblade Dory can come back. Because if they're like, ah, you're on Hatchet Dory, I don't need my sink Belows, I'm fine, I'm just gonna run these, you know, these offensive cards. I'm like, well, uh, if you sideboard wrong, you don't bring your D-Reacts against Dory, you're taking a huge risk, so. So there could be room for that. I, Bolton obviously been very traditionally held down really hard by Dromai. Bolton does well against a lot of the field. Um, I think he could definitely make a big comeback. Kasai won the calling, even though I've been <laughs> I've been telling people for a long time, I'm like I don't guys, I don't know if Kasai is very good, but she she showed that she has enough power to win a calling. So uh, there's that. And then Olympia, I think I I'm pretty sure in part the Mist Veil, one of the Expansion slot cards is going to be an Olympia special edition. I'm almost 100 percent sure about it. Uh, Sounds like you have information then, that we don't. What did I, you... I do not. I do not. I don't know. You said you spoke <laughs> to I, Brian Gottlieb. Uh, <laughs> but I am a huge Olympia fan, so I'm, I'm hope. Here's to hoping that they they put in a they put in a, a specialization, maybe even a weapon. Oh. He could he could use a specialization weapon. So, nice. Shiana players are uh, just so thrilled right now. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Extra specializations are good for her. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's the state of warrior. That's pretty, listen, I mean, that was, it's pretty in depth. It also gives a lot of hope to, like you mentioned, to warrior players. And when, it, when you mentioned the whole thing about Prism and how people might not be on Prism because of the complexity and, and uh, of it, it, it sort of reminds me of the conversation surrounding Kano where everybody's like, it's so, it's overpowered. Well, play it. Like, why are there only 10 that show up to turn <laughs> like to major tournaments if it's so OP? It's because there's a skill level to it that is required. And there was one yep. in the top eight, which was great to see. 
uh is that a, a matchup that you when it, when you come to the complexity like level of of particular heroes to learn i would say obviously kate ho is probably the undisputed it's champ where, where do you place dorinthia if if you know mm -hmm. if one is just i don't know phi in terms of i don't that, that might sound mm -hmm. awful to five people <laughs> but and 10 is is kano mm -hmm. where are you sort of evaluating the complexity of learning um, a hero like, you know, uh, like Dorinthia. So, so Axe's Dorinthia or Hatchet Dorinthia, same with Decimator Dorinthia, uh, is not a very, very difficult class to play tactically. It is a difficult class to play strategically. Uh, so tactics being like, how do I play this four card hand? How do I play this four card hand? Strategy being your, okay, I'm going to fat deck in the mirror. I'm going to play like this overall, right? Um, however, strategy can be learned much easier because if I write a guide and tell you how to play 25 matchups and you read it and listen to it, you and you have good tactical play, which basically all top level players have ta good tactical play, um, you can pick up Hatchet's Dorinthia pretty easily. You just have to know I sideboard in this, I sideboard that out, and I play like this. You could play Hatchet's Dorinthia to 90, 95% of its power. Um, however, Dawnblade Dorinthia is much, much, much more complicated. I could tell you exactly what to do. I, I think this comes through in a lot of my coaching videos. I, I, I do do coaching, and I have put the VODs of the games up. How many times my students and I disagree on decisions? It, it's 20, 30 times in a game, right? And be, whereas if they were playing Hatchet Dory, I don't think we, there would be much yeah. d discrepancy on our decision making. Uh, Dawnblade Dory is really, really complex because you have to understand your opponent, you have to understand your deck, you have to, you don't just get value. Hatchet Dory, you're guaranteed to get value. You hit, you hit, you reset Dynamo, you get your value. Dory is like, you hit, if you don't hit, you don't get your value. You hit, you get your value. And that's what the complexity is. Same with Bolton. I think rated Bolton, fairly straightforward to play. The Switch version of Bolton is more complicated because the combo, you have to understand the whole card pool in the game. You have to know obscure threats. You have to know, like, round, the, the Cyclone Roundhouse can banish your <laughs> Courage of Blade Hold. You have to know, like, all the arsenal threats, etc. So... So that's a little bit more complicated. Kasai, I think, is fairly straightforward to play. Olympia, currently, I think, is fairly straightforward to play. Um, so if I if I put all them on the spectrum, let's see. So uh, Hatchet Dory, Raiden Bolton, Kasai, and Olympia, I would just put them as, like, five. Neither hard nor easy. Uh, whereas Dombley, Dory, Switch, Bolton, I'd put it kind of like as, as a seven. All right. It's deceptive. It's deceptively easy. Like, oh, you just play your warrior's valor and swing. How hard is it? Well, <laughs> well, it's it, yeah. it is, it's harder than it looks, especially against players that know how to play uh, defense properly. Yeah, you just so. chain a, a you know an aether wildfire into a blazing aether, and how hard can it be? Then, like, yeah, everybody yeah, can easy. do it. It's easy. Yeah. You just you just deal thirty two damage. Easy. Yeah. Why aren't we all doing this? Jeez. Yeah. Exactly. Um, there's one more sort of off the beaten path question here. This one coming from Nero sure. Nero Eternal saying, "Do you fear Riptide in the upcoming meta?" No, I have a Decimator Great Axe in my sideboard for a reason. Beautiful, love it. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Um, I have seventy cards and a Decimator Great Axe. I do not fear Riptide. So let's talk to you, you about the card guys, which uh, you sure. mentioned Nathan Crawford uh, a few times mm -hmm. here. I've told Nathan this. I've mentioned it a million times. Nathan Crawford is one of my favorite players playing because he plays decks and, and does things that I like. Um, mm -hmm. You are one of my favorite people. It, it just seems like the card guys in general yeah. are – I mean it, man. Like we've met um, a few times and mm -hmm. we've, we've spoken obviously – but just everybody from the card guys that I seem to meet just seems to be good people, and Nathan is is one of them. Everybody that I speak to, Majin Bay, etc., who de like talks to Majin uh, to to Nathan, I spoken to Nathan. Mitch talking about you, and people talking about you. <laughs> like your guys are just great people, and I appreciate that and what you guys do for the community from a team perspective. Before we dig too deep into it, Josh, there's something that I'm sure everybody wants to know. It's the hot topic. How many people okay. are on the card guys? 
Okay, so we currently have five active players. Myself, Nathan Crawford, Ed Knight, Sebastian Cavallo, and William Bradshaw. There are five of us. We also have our manager, Kyle Jones. And we have two inactive card guys, Alex Sneed and Nambo. Wait, 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 so wait, 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 wait. The total is eight. That's that is that what is this that is that is one that's the first you know toyota rolling up to the tournament for like the wolf pack or runaways like they <laughs> you know uh, I, i'm look yeah we, we can all fit in a van if we want to <laughs> that's unreal that's crazy yep. oh well hey um look i'm just throwing shade because it's fun to do so and um it doesn't we're not a big team we're not a super small team but we're not a big team either no but it, it seems to work and that's very important like the goldilocks of teams just right <laughs> well yeah i will see about that i mean like I, I have a feeling that like just teams are continuing to grow but it seems like this this close-knit team has shown mm -hmm. so much incredible success for everyone involved and it's great to see but can you maybe discuss a little bit because i've spoken to runaways i've spoken to pcg pass all of which had you know 12 to 15 members working together to you know accomplish what they wanted to accomplish did the card guys have an extended you know uh network to prepare yes. for pro tour yes we, we we do we we work very closely with blue pitch so. okay they have eight people. We have five together. We had thirteen. You're still uh, well below the. <laughs> You're still well below we had, the we average. Had thirteen active players. So the the story behind that is that I lived in Hong Kong. I uh, for for many many years. I started the game in Hong Kong, and I played against the Blue Pitch people dozens of times uh, before I left to the U.S. And so I had that good tie with them, and we've been. Uh, able to you know see them at these uh, tier three tier four events uh, and the card guys in blue pitch we're we're we're, we're good friends and uh, you know I, I love every one of those guys that's that's partly why I'm in Hong Kong I'm gonna show up to their team house on yeah. Thursday and just say hey guys looks like we're practicing for Phuket right <laughs> yeah you gotta undertaker yourself out of the casket and be like I'm here bitches like I like, yep. yeah for sure with the, they're you know. gonna be so surprised we're gonna we're gonna. I'm definitely going to take a video of that. Just like, like whoa, why are you here, Josh? <laughs> I want to say, I, de I definitely want to say that I'm like, I'm over the whole joke aspect of, you know, teams being gigantic and whatever. But the problem is, is that every time I'm like, okay, it's put to bed where, we, where I can move on to something else. Roger Bodie, whom I love to death, whom I, I absolutely uh -huh. love, will tweet something like, you know, something where I'm just like, well, Roger, you woke up the, you poked the bear again. I got to make a tweet. Like, I got to make a reference. So every time that yep, Roger yep, makes yep. a tweet, it's like an angel gets his wings kind of thing. Every time Roger makes a tweet, <laughs> I will make another, <laughs> will make another thing. Roger, if you're listening, mm -hmm. I love you. I swear. We, I we, we love you, Roger. Yes. Uh, Roger uh, also. You play Bolton. You're cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, it's part of the warrior, the warrior tribe. So. Um, but talk a little bit perhaps about the prep that was done by the card guys and um, what your, I guess, partnership moving into Pro Tour with Blue Pitch looked like. What kind of hours you guys were putting in and what were the dynamic was? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the team, we, we originally started off on, we, how, how did... Oh, man, this is a while ago. So basically, Nathan was the one that was kind of open to playing a few decks. Seb was pretty set on playing Katsu. Will was pretty set on playing Azalea. Ed was like, uh, if you find a broken deck, I'll play it. If not, I'm going to play uh, Bravo or Victor. Because uh, he, he really enjoys his Guardian, right? Smart. So yeah. it was kind of on Nathan and I to kind of explore a few decks. And the first deck we were exploring was a value-based Bolton deck. So this was a deck that basically was a saber combo bolton but it had better closers so it included blade flurry uh blade runner slice and dice glint the quicksilver and that deck was performing pretty well in testing that's actually the deck i qualified for nats on um was a this this value saber bolton combo is basically kasai but imagine you didn't have to wait for copper you could just kill people on turn two. So that, that was basically the deck. Uh, and we would try that for a bit. But Nathan eventually was like, nah, I feel like this got too many weaknesses on these couple of heroes. Azalea, Dromai, etc. So he he basically hopped off the warrior train. And him and Ed, uh, you know, there, there's some 
USA players that they talked with, and a lot of blue pitch was on Victor. So they basically came up with like, okay, we're just they they came up through their testing that Victor was a very very good deck, and statistically, I think they literally went like twenty four and five, twenty four and five uh, over the weekend in CC games. So. The, the Victor deck is real. Anybody that thinks, oh, Victor didn't top eight the Pro Tour, it's, it's not a good deck. It's a very, very good deck. And it only improves with Dromai leaving. So get your Victor reps in, guys. Uh, so that's what that's how they developed uh, practice for the Pro Tour. As for me, I'm not going to play Victor. There, it's, it's just not happening. So I, I was like, okay, I'm by myself. Let me just, I'm not I, by myself in like my, my team and blue pitch are not really going to help me on this. So I was like, I will talk with my circle of Bolton friends, circle of Dory friends, and I will, you know, you know, just kind of get there by myself. Uh, and that's, that's basically what it was. I was just like doing my own reps and, Oftentimes, I come up to the team. Nathan often jokes about this. I'm like, hey, guys, I think Warrior's good. He's like, and Nathan's like, yeah, yeah, Josh, what is it this time? What deck do you want to show us this time? <laughs> <laughs> I've said, hey, guys, I think Warrior's not too bad like for like three years. That, that's why he's been like, this, this time he's like, yeah, 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 Josh, what is it this time? But this time, he, to be fair, he actually you know, brought a bolted deck to a pro uh, rtn so he you know he actually tried it so shout out to him uh <laughs> but uh I, th I think now if i say hey guys warrior's not too bad maybe, maybe more people on my team will listen so yeah we'll but see. <laughs> how much of this is like people gonna think that it's like j like the broken clock right twice a day kind of thing where you're just yeah, like be, you know if you yeah. say it say it enough times the amount of times like cool. I'll, I'll see really terrible predictions or takes in like a chat or mm -hmm. something and 99 percent of the time the person is wrong but the one time they're right they're just gonna be like yeah. i told you yeah. now i know that that, that, <laughs> that is not you by any means i completely understand that but th this time it's like what felt different about you thinking that hey i think it's good like you said i've been saying it for years it comes down to the fact that i played olympia at an, that was the first glint glimmer when i played olympia at that rtn of, and i just was beating phi i was beating ko i was you know beating bravo and i'm like is this a skill diff or is just the math good? I'm not that I wasn't entirely sure, to be honest. I was like, am I just better than my local competitors or is two plus six reset one just broken? Like, I don't know. And then eventually I was like, OK, we got to explore this with the original hatchet user. And then it went from there. Well, it was it went from there yep. to a successful yep. degree as well. Josh, uh, of the card guys, warrior, master, maestro, uh, virtuoso, even to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for being on the show. I know it was short notice. I know that you came off of a hellish flight, but here you are. <laughs> and um, oh, good. you've got a lot of fans. Me as primarily one. I will not say number one because that's probably Mitch Leslie. But <laughs> I'm not far behind. Just saying. There you go. I'm All a good. I'm more listen, I'm gonna be completely honest with you, Josh. I'm definitely a Josh guy, but I'm more so a Nathan guy. So mm -hmm. much like the strategy You're I use. I'm a card guy, guys. That's it. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm I'm a big fan of that little organization that is just pumping out world class players. So um you mentioned, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity here maybe to plug some of what you're talking about because you mentioned that you do coaching, you do streaming. So where yep. can people get in contact with you should they want to get some of that sure. tutelage, but also just watch you play and uh, get more Josh Lau? Sure. Uh, I do have a Twitter, Josh underscore TCGZ. You can find me there. You can DM me there if you need something. Uh, on the Card Guys YouTube channel, on we, we do live streams. Uh, the team... Tries to stream five days a week, uh, and I stream on Tuesdays in general. The streaming schedule might be a little wonky because I'll be in Asia for the next couple weeks, uh, but I'll still be trying to pump out, you know, some some videos and content there. So we do we do have like uh, live content. We also do have like video content there. Uh, if you are a fan of tier lists, we have many many tier lists for you guys there. Uh, I was only poking fun. 
<laughs> and we, 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 we do sophisticated charts, X, Y axis charts. You know? okay. We don't just do tier lists. That's, that's, that's level no. one. You know, we're, we're pros. We, You're we, adding we, dimensions, we're... which is great. So yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, eventually I'm going to break out the three dimensional graph and we'll, maybe as an April Fool's joke, we have to plan something good. for. That would April be good, Fools. Josh. If you can just yeah. get in, like, get integrated with some sort of VR type thing, right? Where like yeah. it's, and just be like, and then on this timeline and this, you know, that would be, I'm in. <laughs> That'd be great, yeah. Uh, also, we have a Discord server. Uh, you can find that in the description of any of our videos to join that. There's a bunch of people there, so and we're all there, so you, you can ch chit chat with us there. Uh, that's a good way to find me as well. Uh, and we also have a Patreon, so if you want to support the card guys, that would be lovely. Uh, and I also do coaching. Uh, generally, I do coaching for Warrior, obviously. So if you're a huge Warrior fan, uh, you can reach out to me for that uh the and yeah Probably oh better huge shout out to our sponsors we have several at the card guys uh shout out to magnolia gaming they had they had a booth at at the event and they're all around great people thank you to spencer for 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 supporting the card guys we also uh are sponsored by fabric.gg that was one of the places that i checked quite often just to see the you know the the meta game and all that so keep up with what cards people are playing in their deck it's a very very useful website check them out and then finally dragon shield also supports the card guys thanks to them big thanks i, I i've met i've talked to spence all the time whenever we're at an event and he's there spence is a great dude i love spence um and fabric good people uh dragon shield semi semi stuff eh. yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right dude yeah. um Thank you again, and again, who better to teach you how to play Warrior than Josh Lau? So please, if you are interested, go check him out. Get uh, signed up for his uh, coaching, because I promise you, you will not get a better education on a class or a hero like Warrior, like Dorinthia, than you will from Josh Lau. Yep. Josh, and, my boy. And we do post the, the, the VODs to YouTube, so if you just want to watch those, you learn something for free. All good, too. <laughs> or, well, you could do yeah. that, and then you just maybe you just be like, next time you see Josh at an event, you'd be like, Josh, I'm just going to buy you a coffee, maybe I'll like slip you five oh. bucks or something. Like, yeah, for sure. Perfect. That's the way to go. We'll take it. We'll take it. Thanks uh, so much. <laughs> no worries. All right, friends, thank you very much for listening to the Instant Speed Podcast. I do want to let you know that if you want to catch Josh on the Go Again segment, that's basically where we mm. get a little bit more off the rails. I'm going to ask Josh things like, hey, what's your fast food guilty pleasure? Hey, Josh, uh -oh. what, what's the hero that you'll just never play? What's your uh, walkout no. music? We got all kinds of cool Oh, man, fun we got things. lots of good stuff. Yes. You want to be a Tier 3 Patreon subscriber, yep. we're going to do that on uh, – so if you go to uh, patreon.com slash instantspeed, you can sign up there for as little as 2 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. You can support the podcast. Big shout-out also to our chief and lead sponsor. That would be The Realm Games. And there's another giveaway for $10 of store credit at The Realm Games. And I'm going to ask you, if you want to win this, easy. Go in the YouTube comments of this video and tell me, what is your wildest speculation what – chi is because that's going to be mm. a new element coming from part the mist veil so tell me in the in the comments and i will let you know on the next episode who wins that ten dollars of uh store credit josh you legend yeah, very nice, very nice. now last week's episode i was talking to tark patel and tark mm -hmm. insisted he said can i do the closing line to the podcast i don't even know if you know the closing line to the podcast no harm no foul it's the it's the instant speed catchphrase. It's the you're not losing if you're learning. Tarek absolutely flubbed it. Just totally fumbled it. I'm giving you an opportunity here, Josh, to redeem the flesh and blood pro scene right. by dropping that line. Can you do it? Remember, guys, you're not losing if you're learning. Perfect. See you next time on ISP. Well, I work.